Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I am back with some more ancient lore. Today we are going to be wrapping up the Epic of Gilgamesh. We are in Tablet 9, because we left off in Tablet 8. And we are just going to read this into the record. I don't know that there will be anything that I need to add really to it, but we will stop and discuss at the end. So, let's go ahead and get into Tablet 9. Over his friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh cried bitterly, roaming the wilderness. I am going to die. Am I not like Enkidu? Deep sadness penetrates my core. I fear death and now roam the wilderness. I will set out to the region of Utanapishtim, son of Uvatutu, and will go with utmost dispatch. When I arrived in mountain passes at nightfall, I saw lions and I was terrified. I raised my head in prayer to sin to the great lady of the gods, my supplication poured forth, save, save me from. He was sleeping in the night, but awoke with a start, with a dream. A warrior enjoyed his life. He raised his axe in his hand, drew the dagger from his sheath, and fell into their midst like an arrow. He struck, and he scattered them. The name of the former, the name of the second. Twenty-six lines are missing here, telling of the beginning of his quest. The scorpion beings, the mountain, is called Mashu, and then he reached Mount Mashu, which daily guards the rising and setting of the sun, above which only the dome of the heavens reach, and whose flanks reaches as far as the netherworld below. There were scorpion beings watching over its gate. Let's go ahead and stop <clears throat> and note that this can correlate fairly well with the locusts from the book of Revelation, right? He is descending into the land of the dead. In Revelation, the pit opens, the, the scorpion creatures fly out, and they torment men with their tails. This could very well be a correlation in either direction. This is older than the account of Revelation by several millennia, so take from that what you will. Trembling terror they inspire, the sight of them is death. Their frightening aura sweeps over the mountains. At the rising and setting they watch over the sun. When Gilgamesh saw them, trembling terror blanketed his face, but he pulled himself together and drew near to them. The scorpion being called out to his female, he who comes to us his body is the flesh of gods. The scorpion being, his female, answered him. Only two-thirds of him is a god, one-third is human. The male scorpion being called out, saying to the offspring of the gods, Why have you traveled to so distant a journey? Why have you come here to me, over rivers whose crossing is treacherous? I want to learn your... I want to learn. Sixteen lines are missing here. When the text resumes, Gilgamesh is speaking. I have come on account of my ancestor, Utanapashtim, who joined the assembly of the gods and was given eternal life. About death and life, I must ask him. The scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Never has there been, Gilgamesh, a mortal man who could do that. No one has crossed through the mountains for twelve leagues. It is darkness throughout. Dense is the darkness, and light there is none. To the rising of the sun, to the setting of the sun, to the setting of the sun, they caused to go out. Sixty-seven lines are missing, in which Gilgamesh convinces the scorpion being to allow him passage. Though it be in deep sadness and pain, in cold or heat, gasping after breath, I will go on. Now, open the gate. And the scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Go on, Gilgamesh, fear not. The Mashu mountains I give to you freely. The mountains, the ranges you may traverse. In safety may your feet carry you. The gate of the mountain, to the rising of the sun, to the setting of the sun, to the setting of the sun, they cause to go out. Sixty-seven lines are missing, in which Gilgamesh convinces the scorpion being to allow him passage. Though it be in deep sadness and pain, in colder heat, gasping after breath, I will go on. Now, open the gate. The scorpion being spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Go on, Gilgamesh, fear not. 
I must you mountains, I give to you freely, the mountains, the ranges, you may traverse. In safety may your feet carry you, the gate of the mountain. As soon as Gilgamesh heard this, he heeded the utterances of the scorpion being. Along the road of the sun, El he tra and journeyed. One league he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Two leagues he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Twenty-two lines are missing here. Four leagues he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Five leagues he traveled. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Six leagues he traveled, dense was the darkness, light there was none, neither what lies ahead nor what behind does it allow him to see. Seven leagues he traveled, dense was the darkness, light there was none, neither what lies ahead nor dark behind does it allow him to see. Eight leagues he traveled and cried out, dense was the darkness, light there was none, neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Nine leagues he traveled, the north wind. It licked his face. Dense was the darkness, light there was none. Neither what lies ahead nor behind does it allow him to see. Ten leagues he traveled, he is near. Four leagues. Eleven leagues he traveled and came out before the sunrise. Twelve leagues he traveled and it grew brilliant. It bears lapis lazuli as foliage, bearing fruit, a, desire, a delight to look upon. <clears throat> Twenty-five lines are missing here, describing the garden in detail. Cedar, Hadji, of the sea, lapis lazuli, like thorns and briars, carnelian, rubies, hematite, like emeralds, of the sea. Gilgamesh, on walking onward, raised his eyes and saw. And so ends Tablet 9, and this is the beginning of his quest into the underworld. It's not readily apparent if you don't know, right? So I'm trying to stick just to the text as it is without adding too much of the flavor in as we go along. Like the scorpion thing I would have forgotten if I had not stopped and talked about it then. That is a good correlation for the book of Revelation. It's probably source material for John at some point, right? This was this was known, right? That it may not have been widely known but it was probably a story or a fable or whatever even if it wasn't exactly according to the the trial of Gilgamesh this monster was probably known that is making assumptions on my part right I didn't do a deep dive into the history of it or whatever it just seems to be a correlation and it is definitely way before the time of John the Revelator <clears throat> oh. other than that like if you didn't know that this was the beginning of him going to face death and go through the underworld, and you wouldn't know from that passage in particular. So I wanted to make sure I pointed it out that they are beginning the journey into the underworld. Tablet 10. The tavern keeper, Siduri, who lives by the seashore. She lives. The pot stand was made for her. The golden fermenting vat was made for her. She is covered with a veil. Gilgamesh was roving about, wearing a skin, having the flesh of the gods in his body, but sadness deep within, looking like one who has been traveling a long distance. The tavern keeper was gazing off into the distance, puzzling to herself, she said, wandering to herself. That fellow is surely a murderer. Where is he heading? As soon as the tavern keeper saw him, she bolted her door, bolted her gate, bolted the lock. But at her noise, Gilgamesh pricked up his ears, lifted his chin to, to look about, and then laid his eyes on her. Gilgamesh spoke to the tavern keeper, saying, Tavern keeper, what have you seen that made you bolt your door, bolt your gate, bolt the lock? If you do not let me in, I will break your door and smash the lock. Well, that might be what she saw. The wilderness. Gilgamesh. The tavern keeper, Siduri, who lives by the seashore. She lives. 
The pot stand was made for her. The golden fermenting vat was made for her. She is covered with a veil. Gilgamesh was roving about, wearing the skin, having the flesh of the gods in his body, but sadness deep within him, looking like one who has been traveling a long distance. The tavern keeper was gazing off into the distance and puzzling to herself, she said, wondering to herself, that fellow is surely a murderer. Where is he heading? As soon as the tavern keeper saw him, she bolted her door, bolted her lock, bolted the, bolted the gate. But at her noise, Gilgamesh pricked up his ears and lifted his chin and laid his eyes on her. And Gilgamesh spoke to the tavern keeper, saying, Tavern keeper, what have you seen that made you bolt your door and bolt your gate and bolt the lock? If you do not let me in, I will break your door and smash the lock. The wilderness, Gilgamesh, gate. Gilgamesh said to the tavern keeper, I am Gilgamesh. I killed the guardian. I destroyed Humbaba, who lived in the cedar forest. I slew lions in the mountain passes. I grappled with the bull that came down from heaven, and I killed him. The tavern keeper spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, If you were Gilgamesh, who killed the guardian, who destroyed Humbaba and lived in the cedar forest, who slew lions in the mountain passes, who grappled the bull that came down from heaven and killed him, why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within you? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance, so that ice and heat have seared your face? You roam the wilderness. And Gilgamesh spoke to her, to the tavern keeper. He said, Tavern keeper, should not my cheeks be emaciated? Should my heart not be wretched, my features not haggard? Should there not be a sadness deep within me? Should I not look like one who has been traveling a long distance, and should ice and heat not have seared my face? Should I not roam the wilderness? My friend, the wild ass who chased the wild donkey, panther of the wilderness, Enkidu, the wild ass who chased the wild donkey, panther of the wilderness, we journeyed together, joined together, and went up into the mountain, we grappled with and killed the bull of heaven. We destroyed Humbaba, who lived in the cedar forest. We slew lions in the mountain passes. My friend, whom I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me. Enkidu, whom I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me. The fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I mourned over him and would not allow him to be buried until a maggot fell out of his nose. I was terrified by his appearance. I began to fear death, and so roamed the wilderness. The issue of my friend oppresses me, so I have been rowing the long trails through the wilderness. The issue of Enkidu, my friend, oppresses me, so I have been roaming the long roads through the wilderness. How can I stay silent? How can I be still? My friend, whom I love, has turned to clay. Am I not like him? Will I lie down never to get up again? Gilgamesh spoke to the tavern keeper, saying, So now, tavern keeper, what is the way to Utana Pishtim? What are its markers? Give them to me. Give me the markers. If possible, I will cross the sea. If not, I will roam through the wilderness. And the tavern keeper spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, There ne has never been, Gilgamesh, any passage whatever. There has never been anyone since the days of yore who crossed the sea. The only one who crosses the sea is Valiant Shamash. Except for him, who can cross? The crossing is difficult, its ways are treacherous, and in between are the waters of death that bar its approaches. And even if, Gilgamesh, you should cross the sea, when you reach the waters of death, what would you do? Gilgamesh, over there is Ur Shabbat Shunabi, the ferryman of Utanapishtim. The stone things are with him, and he is in the woods picking mint. Go on, let him see your face. If possible, cross with him. If not, you should turn back. When Gilgamesh heard this, he raised his axe in his hand and drew the dagger from his belt and slipped stealthily away after them. Like an arrow, he fell among them, the stone things, from the middle of the woods. He, their noise could be heard. Urshanabi, the sharp-eyed, saw. When he heard the axe, he ran towards it. He struck his head, Gilgamesh. He clapped his hands in his chest. While the stone things, the boat, waters of death, broad sea, and the waters of death, 
to the river, to the boat, on the shore. Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, the ferryman. You. Urshanabi spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within you? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance, so that ice and heat have seared your face? Why, you roam the wilderness. Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, saying, Urshanabi, should not my cheeks be emaciated, my expression desolate? Should my heart not be wretched, my features not haggard? Should there not be sadness deep within me? Should I not look like one who has been traveling a long distance? And should ice and heat not have seared my face? Should I not roam the wilderness? My friend who chased wild asses in the mountains, the panther of the wilderness. Enkidu, my friend, who chased wild asses in the mountain, the panther in the wilderness. We joined together and went up into the mountain. We grappled with and killed the bull of heaven. We destroyed Humbaba, who dwelled in the cedar forest. We slew lions in the mountain passes. My friend, whom I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me. Enkidu, my friend, whom I love deeply, who went through every hardship with me. The fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I mourned over him and would not allow him to be buried until a maggot fell out of his nose. I was terrified by his appearance. I began to fear death and so roam the wilderness. The issue of my friend oppresses me, so I have been roaming long trails through the wilderness. The issue of Enkidu, my friend, oppresses me, so I have been roaming long roads through the wilderness. How can I stay silent? How can I be still? My friend, whom I love, has turned to clay. Enkidu, my friend, whom I love, has turned to clay. Am I not like him? Will I lie down, never to get up again? Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi, saying, Now, Urshanabi, what is the way Ut to Utanapashtim? What are its markers? Give them to me. Give me the markers. If possible, I will cross the sea. If not, I will roam through the wilderness. Urshanabi spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, It is your hands, Gilgamesh, that prevent the crossing. You have smashed the stone things. You have pulled out their retaining ropes. The stone things have been smashed. The retaining ropes pulled out. Gilgamesh, <clears throat> take the axe in your hand. Go down into the woods and cut down three hundred punting poles, each sixty cubits in length. Strip them, attach caps, and bring them to the boat. When Gilgamesh heard this, he took up the axe in his hand and drew the dagger from his belt and went down into the woods and cut three hundred punting poles each and sixty cubits in length. He stripped them and attached caps and brought them to the boat. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi bearded the boat. Gilgamesh launched the Megalu boat, and they sailed away. By the third day they had traveled a stretch of a month and a half, and Urshanabi arrived at the waters of death. And Urshanabi said to Gilgamesh, Hold back, Gilgamesh, take a punting pole, but your hand must not pass over the waters of death. Take a second, Gilgamesh, a third, and a fourth pole. Take a fifth, Gilgamesh, a sixth, and a seventh pole. Take an eighth, Gilgamesh, a ninth, and a tenth pole. Take an eleventh Gilgamesh and a twelfth pole. In twice sixty rods, Gilgamesh had used up the punting poles. When he loosed his waist cloth for, Gilgamesh stripped off his garment and held it up on the mast with his arms. Utanapashtim was gazing off into the distance, puzzling to himself, he said, wandering to himself. Why are the stone things of the boat smashed to pieces? And why is someone not its master sailing on it? The one who is coming is not a man of mine. I keep looking, but not. I keep looking, but not. I keep looking. Lines are missing here. Utana Pishtim said to Gilgamesh, Why are your cheeks emaciated, your expression desolate? Why is your heart so wretched, your features so haggard? Why is there such sadness deep within you? Why do you look like one who has been traveling a long distance so that ice and heat have seared your face? You roam the wilderness. And Gilgamesh spoke to Utanapishtim, saying, Should not my cheeks be emaciated, my expression desolate? Should not my heart be wretched, my features not haggard? Should there not be sadness deep within me? 
Should I not look like one who has been traveling a long distance, and should ice and heat not have seared my face? Should I not roam the wilderness? My friend who chased wild asses in the mountain, the panther of the wilderness, Enkidu, my friend who chased wild asses in the mountains, the panther of the wilderness, we joined together and went up into the mountain. We grappled with and killed the bull of heaven. We destroyed Humbaba who dwelled in the cedar forest. We slew lions in the mountain passes. My friend, whom I loved deeply, went through every hardship with me. Enkidu, my friend, whom I loved deeply, went through every hardship with me. The fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I mourned over him and would not allow him to be buried until a maggot fell out of his nose. I was terrified by his appearance. I began to fear death and so roamed the wilderness. The issue of my friend oppresses me, so I have been roaming long trails through the wilderness. The issue of Enkidu, my friend, oppresses me, so I have been roaming long roads through the wilderness. How can I stay silent? How can I be still? My friend, whom I love, has turned to clay. Enkidu, my friend, whom I love, has turned to clay. Am I not like him? Will I lie down, never to get up again? Gilgamesh spoke to Utanapishtim, saying, That is why I must go on, to see Utanapishtim, whom they call the faraway. I went circling through all the mountains. I traversed treacherous mountains and crossed all the seas. That is why sweet sleep has not mellowed my face, though through sleepless, night, sleepless striving I am strained. My muscles are filled with pain. I have not yet reached the tavern keeper's area before my clothing gave out. I killed bear, hyena, lion, panther, tiger, stag, red stag, and beast of the wilderness. I ate their meat and wrapped their skins around me. The gate of grief must be bolted shut, sealed with pitch and bitumen. As for me, dancing. For me, unfortunate, it will root out. Utanapishtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Why, Gilgamesh, do you? Sadness? You, who were created from the flesh of gods and mankind, who made like your father and mother? Have you ever, Gilgamesh, to the fool? They placed a chair in the assembly, but to the fool they gave dregs instead of beer dregs instead of butter, Bran and cheap flour, which like, clothed with a loin cloth, like, and in place of a sash, because he does not have, does not have words of counsel. Take care about it, Gilgamesh, their master. Sin, eclipse of the moon. The gods are sleepless. They are troubled, restless. Long ago it has been established. You trouble yourself, your help. If Gilgamesh, the temple of the gods, the temple of the holy gods, the gods, mankind, they took for his fate. You have toiled without cease, and what have you got? Through toil you wear yourself out, you fill your body with grief. Your long, long time, your long lifetime you are bringing near to a premature end. Mankind, whose offshoot is snapped off like a reed in a canebrake. The fine youth and lovely girl. Death. No one can see death. No one can see the face of death. No one can hear the voice of death. Yet there is a savage death that snaps off mankind. For how long do we build a household? For how long do we seal a document? For how long do brothers share the inheritance? For how long is there to be jealousy in the land? For how long has the river risen and brought the overflowing waters? So the dragonflies drift down the river. The face that could, that could gaze upon the face of the sun has never existed ever. How alike are the sleeping and the dead that the image of death cannot be depicted. Yes, you are, human being, a man. After Enlil had pronounced the blessing, the Anunnaki, the great gods, assembled. <coughs> Mamimitum, she who forms destiny, determined destiny with them. They established death and life, but they did not make known the days of death. And so ends tablet number 10. And this is him going into the darkness, into death. He is attempting to go to Enkidu, right? He's 
tempting death by going into the land of the dead. And here he is being told, you don't want to do this, you're not going to make it back. Oh, it is interesting to note there is something here. This text is roughly 4,000 years old. Between 3,500 and 4,000 years old is how old the clave tablets are that it's drawn from. There is a theory that is going around that once upon a time, our sky did not look the same. That once upon a time, you could look at the sun. But we have, for no subversive reason, would it be inserted into here. It is an, an explanation that this thing is impossible that you see. That he says that no man has ever been able to look at the sun. That's a good piece of wisdom to carry forth. Now, if this would have been a subversive text where you should be in doubt of the details in that manner, then hold on to your whatever preconceived beliefs about the configuration of the sky. Now, this that could be prior to the 4,000 years ago, but they were drawing upon their well of knowledge from 4,000 years ago. So it's going to be hard to correlate that with being able to gaze upon the sun fully. I know people sun gaze now. That is a whole process. And you don't peek at the sun full straight. I promise you. That's what they're saying here. The theory is that once upon a time you could. You could literally look at the sun at any time and not be in distress. So I did want to point that out. And now we're going to get into tablet 11, which is the final tablet. Uh, and wrap up the story. So... <clears throat> Gilgamesh spoke to Utanapachtim, the faraway. I have been looking at you, but your appearance is not strange. You are like me. You yourself are not different. You, you are like me. My mind was resolved to fight with you, but instead my arm lies useless over you. Tell me, how is it that you stand in the assembly of the gods and have found life? Utanapachtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, I will reveal to you, Gilgamesh, a thing that is hidden, a secret of the gods, I will tell you. Shurupak, a city that you surely know, situated on the banks of the Euphrates. That city was very old, and there were gods inside it. The hearts of the great gods moved them to inflict the flood. Their father, Anu, uttered the oath of secrecy. Valiant Enlil was their advisor, and Nurta was their chamberlain, and Nanugi was the minister of Canals, Yah, the clever prince, was under oath with them, so he repeated their talk to the Reed House. Reed House, Reed House, wall, wall, O man of Shurupuk, son of Uwatutu, tear down the house and build a boat, abandon wealth and seek living beings, spurn possessions and keep alive living beings, make all living beings go up into the boat, the boat which you are to build, its dimensions must measure equal to each other. Its length must correspond to its width. Roof it over like the Apsu. I misunderstood and spoke to my lord. Yah, my lord, thus is the command which you have uttered. I will heed and will do it. But what shall I answer the city, the populace, and the elders? And Yah spoke, commanding me, his servant. You, well then, this is what you must say to them. It appears that Enlil is rejecting me, so I cannot reside in your city, nor set foot on Enlil's earth. I will go down to the Apsu and to live with my lord, Yah, and upon you he will rain down abundance, a profusion of fowl, myriad fishes. He will bring to you a harvest of wealth. In the morning he will let loaves of bread shower down, and in the evening a rain of wheat. And just as dawn began to glow, the land assembled around me. The carpenter carried his hatchet, the reed worker carried his flattening stone, the men. The child carried the pitch, the weak brought whatever else was needed. On the fifth day I laid out her exterior. It was a field in area, its walls were each ten times twelve cubits in height. Its sides of its top were of equal length, ten times its cubit each. I laid out its interior structure and drew a picture of it. I provided it with six decks, thus dividing it into seven levels. The inside of it I divided into nine compartments. I drove plugs to keep water out in its metal part. 
I saw to the punting poles and laid in what was necessary. Three times 3,600 units of raw bitumen I poured into the bitumen kiln. Three times 3,600 units of pitch into it. There were three times 3,600 porters of cask who carried vegetable oil. Or oil. Apart from the 3,600 units of oil which they consumed, and two times 3,600 units of oil the boatmen stored away, I butchered oxen for the meat, and day upon day I slaughtered sheep. I gave the workmen ale, beer, oil, and wine as if it were river water, so that they could make a party like the New Year's festival, and I set my hand to the oiling. The boat was finished by sunset. The launching was very difficult. They had to keep carrying a runway of poles, front to back, until two-thirds of it had gone into the water. Whatever I had loaded on it, whatever silver I had loaded on it, whatever gold I had loaded on it, all the living beings that I had loaded on it, I had all my kith and kin go up into the boat, all the beasts and animals of the field and craftsmen I had go up. Shamash had set a stated time. In the morning I will let down, let loaves of bread shower down, and in the evening a rain of wheat. Go inside the boat, seal the entry. That stated time had arrived. In the morning he let loaves of bread shower down, <clears throat> and in the evening a rain of wheat. I watched the appearance of weather. The weather was frightful to behold. I went into the boat and sealed the entry. For the caulking of the boat, to Puzuramuri, the boatman. I gave the palace together with its contents. Just as dawn began to glow, there arose from the horizon a black cloud. Adad rumbled inside of it. Before him went Shulat and Hanish, heralds, going over mountain and land. Aragal pulled out the mooring poles. Forth went Ninurta and made the dikes overflow. The Anunnaki lifted up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their flare. Stunned shock over a deed's deeds, a dad's deeds, overtook the heavens and turned to blackness all that had been light. The land shattered like a pot. All day long the south wind blew, blowing fast, submerging the mountain and water, overwhelming the people like an attack. No one could see his fellow. They could not recognize each other in the torrent. The gods were frightened by the flood and retreated, ascending to the heaven of Anu. The gods were cowering like dogs, crouching by the outer wall. Ishtar shrieked like a woman in childbirth. The sweet-voiced mistress of the gods wailed. The olden days have a lust turned to clay. Because I said evil things in the assembly of the gods, how could I say evil things in the assembly of the gods, ordering a catastrophe to destroy my people? No sooner have I given birth to my dear people than they fill the sea like so many fish. The gods, those of the Anunnaki, were weeping with her. The gods humbly sat weeping, sobbing with grief, their lips burning, parched with thirst. Six days and seven nights came the wind and the floods, the storm flattening the land. When the seventh day arrived, the storm was pounding. The flood was a war, struggling with itself like a woman writhing in labor. Interesting. The sea calmed, fell still. The whirlwind and flood stopped up. I looked around all day long. Quiet had set in, and all the human beings had turned to clay. The terrain was flat as a roof. I opened a vent in the fresh air. Daylight fell upon the side of my nose. I fell to my knees and sat weeping. Tears streaming down the side of my nose. I looked around for coastlines in the expanse of the sea, and at twelve leagues there emerged a region of land on Mount Namush. The boat lodged firm. Mount Namush held the boat, allowing no sway. One day in a second, Mount Namush held the boat, allowing no sway. A third day, a fourth, Mount Namush held the boat, allowing no sway. A fifth, a sixth, Mount Namush held the boat, allowing no sway. And when a seventh day arrived, I sent forth a dove and released it, and the dove went off but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a swallow and released it, and the swallow went off but 
came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a raven and released it, and the raven went off and saw the waters slither back. It eats, it scratches, it bobs, but does not circle back to me. Then I sent out everything in all directions and sacrificed the sheep. I offered incense in front of the mountain ziggurat. Seven and seven cult vessels I put in place, and into the fire underneath or into their bowls I poured reed, cedar, and myrtle. The gods smelled the savor, the gods smelled the sweet savor, and collected like flies over a sheep sacrifice. Just then Maliti arrived. She lifted up the large flies, beads, which Anu had made for his enjoyment. You gods, as surely as I shall not forget this lapis lazuli around my neck, may I be mindful of these days and never forget them. The gods may come to the incense offering, but Enlil may not come to the incense offering, because without considering he brought about the flood and consigned my people to annihilation. Just then, Enlil arrived. He saw the boat and became furious. He was filled with rage at the Agigi gods. Where did, why, where did a living being escape? No man was to survive the annihilation. Ninurta spoke to Valiant Enlil, saying, Who else but Yah could have devised such a thing? It is Yah who knows every machination. La spoke to Valiant Enlil, saying, It is yours, O Valiant One, who is the sage of the gods. How could you bring about a flood without consideration? Charge the violation to the violator, charge the offense to the offender. But be compassionate, lest mankind be cut off. Be patient, lest they be killed. Instead of your bringing on the flood, would that a lion had appeared to diminish the people. Instead of your bringing on the flood, would that a wolf had appeared to diminish the people. Instead of bringing on the flood, would that a famine had occurred to slay the land. Instead of your bringing on the flood, would that a pestilent era had appeared to have ravaged the land. It was not I who revealed the secret of the great gods. I only made a dream appear to Atrahasis, and thus he heard the secret of the gods. Now then, the deliberation should be about him. Enla went up inside the boat, and grasping my hand made me go up. He had my wife go up and kneel by my side. He touched our forehead, and standing between us, he blessed us. Previously, Utanapishtim was a human being, but now let Atunapishtim and his wife become like us, the gods. Let Atunapishtim reside far away at the mouth of the rivers. They took us far away and settled us at the mouth of the rivers. Now then, who will convene the gods on your behalf, that you may find the life you are seeking? Wait. You must not lie down for six days and seven nights. Soon as he sat down with his head between his legs, sleep, like a fog, blew upon him. Utanus Pishtim said to his wife, Look there, the man, the youth, who wanted eternal life. Sleep, like a fog, blew over him. His wife said to Utanus Pishtim, the far away, Touch him. Let the man awaken. Let him return safely by the way he came. Let him return to his land by the gate through which he left. And then Tutanapishtim said to his wife, Mankind is deceptive and will deceive you. Come, bake loaves for him and keep setting them by his head, and draw on the wall each day that he lay down. And she baked his loaves and placed them by his head, and marked on the wall the day that he laid down. The first loaf was desiccated, the second stale, the third moist, the fourth turned white. It's the fifth sprouted gray mold, the sixth, still fresh, the seventh, suddenly he touched him, and the man awoke. And Gilgamesh said to Atuna Pishtim, The very moment sleep was pouring over me, you touched me and alerted me. And Atuna Pishtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Look over here, Gilgamesh, count your loaves. You should be aware of what is marked on the wall. Your first loaf is desiccated, the second stale, the third moist, your fourth turned white, it's the fifth sprouted gray mold. The sixth is still fresh. The seventh, suddenly he touched him, and the man awoke. Gilgamesh said to Utenapishtim, The very moment sleep was pouring over me, you touched me and alerted me. And Utenapishtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, 
Look over here, Google Mesh. Count your loaves. You should be aware of what is marked on the wall. Your first loaf is desiccated, the second stale, the third moist, your fourth turned white. It's the fifth sprouting gray mold, the sixth is still fresh, the seventh. At that instant, you awoke. And Gilgamesh said to Atanapishtim, the far away, O oh, woe, what shall I do, Atanapishtim, where shall I go? The snatcher has taken a hold of my flesh, in my bedroom dwelt death dwells, and wherever I set my foot, there too is death. Home, empty-handed, Utanapishtim said to Urshanali, the ferryman, May the harbor reject you, may the ferry landing reject you. May you, who used to walk its shores, be denied its shores. The man in front of whom you walk, matted hair chains his body. Animal skins have ruined his beautiful skin. Take him away. Lord Shanabi, bring him to the washing place. Let him wash his matted hair in water like a loo. Let him cast away his animal skin and have the sea carry it off. Let his body be moistened with oil. Let the wrap around his head be made new. Let him wear royal robes worthy of him until he goes off to his city, until he sets off on his way. Let his royal robe not become spotted. Let it be perfectly new. Ur Shanabi took him away and brought him to the washing place. He washed his matted hair with water like a loo. He cast off his animal skins, and the sea carried it Oh, He moistened his body with fine oil and made a new wrap for his head. He put a royal robe worthy of him, until he went away to his city, until he set off on his way. <clears throat> his royal robe remained unspotted. It was perfectly clean. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi boarded the boat. They cast off the Magal Magalu boat and sailed away. The wife of Utanapishtim, the far away, said to him, Gilgamesh came here exhausted and worn out. What can you give him so that he can return to his land with honor? And then Gilgamesh raised a punting pole and drew the boat to shore. Utanapishtim spoke to Gilgamesh, saying, Gilgamesh, you came here exhausted and worn out. What can I give you so you can return to your land? I will disclose to you a thing that is hidden, Gilgamesh. Uh, I will tell you. There is a plant, like a box thorn, whose thorns will prick your hand like a rose. If your hands reach that plant, you will become a young man again. Hearing this, Gilgamesh opened a conduit to the Apsu and attached heavy stones to his feet. They dragged him down to the Apsu. They pulled him. He took the plant, though it pricked his hand, and cut the heavy stones from his feet, letting the waves throw him onto its shores. And Gilgamesh spoke to Urshanabi the ferryman, saying, Urshanabi, this plant is a plant against decay, by which a man can attain his survival. I will bring it to Uruk Havin, and have an old man eat the plant to test it. The plant's name is The Old Man Becomes a Young Man. Then I will eat it and return to the condition of my youth. At twenty leagues they broke for some food, and at thirty leagues they stopped for the night. Seeing a spring and how cool its waters were, Gilgamesh went down and was bathing in the water. A snake smelled the fragrance of the plant, silently came up and carried off the plant. While going back, it sloughed off its casing. At, the point, at that point, Gilgamesh sat down weaving, his tears streaming over the side of his nose. Counsel me, O ferryman, O Shinabi, for whom my arms labored. Urshanabi, for whom my, my heart's blood roiled. I have not secured any good deed for myself, but done a good deed for the lion of the ground. Now the high waters are coursing twenty leagues distant. As I was opening the conduit, I turned my equipment over into it. What can I find to serve as a marker for me? I will turn back from the journey by sea and leave the boat by the shore. At twenty leagues they rode for some food, and at thirty leagues they stopped for the night. They arrived in Uruk Haven, and Gilgamesh said to Urshanabi, the ferryman, Go up, Urshanabi, into the, onto the wall of Uruk, and walk around. Examine its foundation, inspect its brickwork thoroughly. Is not even the core of the brick structure of kiln fire and brick? And did not the seven sages themselves lay out its plan? One league city, one league palm gardens. 
one league lowlands, the open area of the Ishtar Temple, three leagues and the opening open area of Uruk it encloses. And so ends tablet number 11 and our study of the Epic of Gilgamesh. <clears throat> this was a retelling or a pre-telling of the flood story. It's definitely got different details, right? It is not Noah and his Noah building it and then bringing his sons and then his wives. But instead, we have Utana Pishtim, who built the ark with assistance of people around him, and people around him were saved along with him, not just his family. That is an important deviation. It talks about the stocking up of food and how the things were brought to him, and some of that is the same. The, the keeping of the animals is somewhat the same. Uh, the length of time is a little bit different. The method of getting off is a little bit different. He's got an extra bird than Noah did, but it's basically the same story. And it predates the biblical one significantly. And so take from that what you will. This was a very good thing to read aloud for myself, and it, it firmed it for me in a way that hearing it didn't. So I'll leave the link down below so that you can go back and experience that for yourself if you were so inclined. For some people, hearing it is enough. For some people, they have to read it. Hopefully, I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a not-too-difficult topic. There was not an, a whole lot for me to add to this except to point out a few references that could indeed be brought back to the Bible, including the the flood cycle. That That's an interesting thing, too. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.